Hello there, and welcome back to the introduction to English linguistics. This is the second video on psycholinguistics. Psycholinguistics, as you will remember, has three main branches. It is concerned with language comprehension, with language production, and with language acquisition. In the last video, I discussed aspects of language comprehension. So now it's time to move on to language production. What cognitive and physiological processes happen when you produce words and sentences? Let me show you again this overview chart of what happens when you produce and process language. In this video, we will take a closer look at the first half of this graph. What goes on in the speaker during language production? We know that there are certain tasks involved. The speaker has to think of something to say, select words that express this thought, arrange those words into a sequence, and finally pronounce the sequence of words. How does all of this work in detail? That's what we're going to discuss in this video. So let's talk about speech production. I want to single out three processes that are of central importance with regard to speech production. The first process is called conceptualization. How do speakers think of things to say? Second is the process of formulation. How do speakers select words that match those concepts? How do they put those words into a coherent structure? In short, how do they do linguistic, grammatical stuff with the idea that they have formed? That's formulation. The third step is articulation. Yeah? Once you have built up a coherent morphosynactic structure, you have to articulate that structure to get it out to a listener who can perceive it. Right. I'll come back to each of these steps. Let's talk about conceptualization first, thinking of things to say. How do you think of things to say? Now, I am really not the kind of person that you would ask for advice on how to behave at parties. However, I do have a piece of advice. Um, let's say you find yourself at a party that is kind of boring. You know, the conversation is going slow. Try this ask the next person in the room so do you think in words or do you think in images and it will turn out that pretty much everyone in the room has a very concrete idea about how they do it person one says i think in words i do that all the time i spend some time in spain and at the end of the time i was actually thinking in spanish the next person will say listen i think in images. When I think of a dog, you know, I have that dog before my eyes. It's there. And the third person might say, I think in bodily sensations. When I think of a beach, it's like I can feel the grains of sand under my feet. It's fantastic. So who's right? Do you think in words, in images, in sensations? What goes on there? Well, the trouble is your introspection your imagination does a very poor job of telling you how your brain works. Think about it. It does a very poor job of telling you how something very simple like your kidney works. Yeah. If it can't do the kidney, how do you expect it to explain itself to you? Yeah? How can the brain explain the brain to you? It just doesn't work. So that's the next thing that you might point out at the party. Everyone will think that you're a smart ass, but well, I, I did warn you. Okay. Why am I telling you all of this? Okay. Um, we need to take a look at what psychologists and cognitive scientists have to say about how conceptualization really works. There's a consensus there that when you form a concept, when you form an idea, you generate what is called a pre-verbal message, a concept that is not, or at least not exclusively, linguistic. Some theories go so far as to say that there is a language of thought, a mentalese, a language of the mind. And this language would have to be translated into English or Spanish or French. Um, I'm not too sure about that. A theory that I find very plausible, very convincing, goes by the name of embodied cognition. What's embodied cognition? Well, think about a nice cup of ice cream. Three flavors, chocolate, vanilla, pistachio, ah, maybe strawberry, and uh, you know, a bit of whipped cream, maybe chocolate sauce, caramel if you like. And uh, now imagine you know, taking a teaspoon and, and taking a spoon of that nice 
ice cream, letting it melt in your mouth. Hmm. Good, no? Yeah. So thinking about ice cream in this way activates those brain areas that are active when you're actually doing the real thing, when you're actually eating ice cream. So what your brain does in forming this concept, eating an ice cream, is it simulates the kinds of processes that happen when you're eating an actual cup of ice cream, embodied cognition. So um, you have formed a concept. Great. The next step would be to match that concept with words. You have to find words. This is commonly assumed to be a two-stage process where you first match a concept with a so-called lemma. What's a lemma? A lemma is a word without any of its grammatical inflections. So if you think of eating an ice cream, you think of the verb eat, which is not yet inflected for person or tense, for instance. In the second step, then, you outfit the lemma eat with inflections to build a real word, like eating, for instance. So you take the lemma, say cat, and you uh, provide it with a nice plural suffix. You know, you think of several cats. That's how you do it. You drink, you think of, you know, that guy is drinking too much. You think of the lemma drink, and you provide it with the progressive ing. So, finding words. Wait a minute, where do you find those words? Well, you do find them in a magical place that is called the mental lexicon. I talked about the mental lexicon in earlier lectures and the morphology lectures, but I think it's useful to back up a little bit and talk about the mental lexicon. So what does it mean to know a word when you as a speaker know a word? Well, in order to use a word to find it, yeah, you need to know about the word's sounds, their order, the meaning of the word, how the word combines with affixes, and how the word combines with other words. So, for instance, you would know that the verb eat can take an object, yeah, eat, an ice cream. All of this knowledge is stored in the mental lexicon. The mental lexicon is called a lexicon because, well, there are many words in the mental lexicon, but it is quite different from an ordinary paper dictionary. There are similarities and differences between a dictionary and the mental lexicon. Both store information on word sounds, spelling, meaning, and syntactic class, but there are important differences. A dictionary has all the words organized in alphabetical order. The mental lexicon doesn't know alphabetical order. It has an associative organization. <clears throat> Okay, also association by sound, but um, not by sound and by meaning. The dictionary stores mainly single words, whereas the mental lexicon stores also many word combinations. You know, shoot the breeze, you know, idioms, that kind of stuff. The dictionary stores only the base forms, the lemmas, whereas the mental lexicon also stores high-frequency inflected forms. So similarities and differences between an ordinary dictionary and the mental lexicon. Okay, I'm telling you all of this, but how do we actually know that this is how the mental lexicon is organized? Well, most of what we know about language production and also about the mental lexicon, we have learned through the analysis of speech errors and anomalies, things like the tip of the tongue phenomenon or spontaneous mistakes that speakers make, or uh, speech disorders that completely disrupt the ability to speak, for instance, as a result of stroke or brain injury. Seeing how the capacity for speech breaks down offers us some insights into how speech production normally works. So we have to think, what would the system have to be like for the mistakes to come out exactly like they do? Okay. And um, in order to do that, it's useful to have a large database of speech errors. And I want to point you to a database of speech errors that Victoria Frumkin has put together. And it's actually online. You can access it. Here it is. You can just Google Victoria Frumkin speech error database. So here we can look for 
English speech errors, uh, what error type? Let's take a lexical error. Search. I just click on the first one. Um, the error utterance was a 50 pound dog of bag food. Yeah, when the speaker really wanted to say a 50 pound bag of dog food. That's called an exchange error. We'll look at those in more detail. Right. So <clears throat> let me talk a minute uh, about the tip of the tongue phenomenon in which a speaker cannot articulate a word that they know and they are aware that they know this word and they are desperate to find out what word it is. So quite often speakers that suffer from the tip of the tongue phenomenon know the number of syllables that the word has, they know the stress pattern of the word, they know the initial sound. Ah, what's this word? It starts with an A. It starts with an A. Um, and in languages that have grammatical gender, like Italian or German, often the speakers even know the gender. So, what does this mean? What does this tell us about the mental lexicon? Well, it tells us that word entries in the mental lexicon have several components, yeah? where the sounds are stored, where the meaning is stored, where the <clears throat> grammatical characteristics like gender are stored, and sometimes some of these components are selectively unavailable. Yeah, quite scary, but tells us something about the organization of the mental lexicon. Uh, here's a type of error that also tells us something about the organization of the mental lexicon. These errors are called malapropisms. Um, for instance, somebody might produce the phrase Fillmore's face grammar, when really what they want to say is Fillmore's case grammar. I once uh, told my friends that the jar was hermeneutically sealed, when really what I wanted to say was the jar was hermetically sealed. Um, yeah, you, you know, the OED will tell you what hermeneutically means. Um, right, so here I replaced one word with a similar sounding word. And what this tells us about the mental dictionary is that similar sounding words are connected in the mental lexicon. So, there are associative ties between similar sounding words. Okay, another little thing that I want to demonstrate to you is the so-called Stroop task. Um, it also tells us something about the mental lexicon. So let's do this. In a moment, you will see words displayed on the screen, and as fast as you can, name the color in which the words are displayed. You're ready? Then you can click your imaginary next button. Yeah? Okay. Click, and then name the color, okay? Not the word, name the color. Blue, red, green, red, green, orange, blue, red, gray. Okay, <laughs> done it. So, you get the task there. Uh, there are some lessons to be learned from the Stroop task. Congruent items in which the color of the font and the word that is displayed are the same, they are resolved relatively fast. In conflicting items, for instance here, green printed in blue, those take longer and provoke errors. So the conclusion of that is that reading a color interferes with the process of linking a color concept to its word. It messes with the word finding process. And why should that be? Well. It's like that because the word blue and the word green, they are stored in very similar places in your brain. It's the same area. And if you ask your brain to do two things in the same area, it goes like, I can't do this, sorry, I'm busy. Yeah, so the same area of the mental lexicon cannot handle two very similar tasks at the same time. That's what the Stroop task nicely demonstrates. So, that's what I wanted to say about word finding. Now, let's move on to formulation, putting words into a coherent structure. Formulation is thought to have two aspects to it. Um, one of them is functional processing, finding words, assigning functional roles to those words, who did what to whom. And then the second aspect of formulation is called positional processing putting the words into a linear order that you can articulate, and 
outfitting the words with endings that represent their functional roles. Okay, how do we know that this is how it works? Well, again, we have evidence from speech errors, for instance, from exchange errors, yeah, the, the, the dog of bag food, yeah, from a minute ago. Um, here's another exchange error. He ordered up ending vegetable soup. The person wanted to say he ended up ordering vegetable soup, but the lemmas of the same type, of the verb type, they were exchanged. Yeah, so both are verbs and their position is mixed up, but the words are still in the right category and their morphological marking yeah, uh, matches the target utterance. So that's evidence that elements in the mental lexicon are marked up for the word classes so that they are exchanged only with elements that belong to the same class. Um, another type of exchange error, a very funny one, uh, they're called spoonerisms. Um, there's this guy called Spooner. You can look that up on Wikipedia. So some famous Spoonerisms are our queer old Dean for our dear old Queen. You have tasted the whole worm. Yeah, you have wasted the whole term. Work is the curse of the drinking classes. That's yeah, too good to be true. Um, in Spoonerisms, segments of words are exchanged systematically so that, for instance, an onset sound replaces another onset. Um, what does this show? Well, the exchange of onset sounds across different words here shows that whole phrases are planned before they are articulated. Right. I want to mention another phenomenon that informs our understanding of how formulation works, and that phenomenon is called syntactic priming. The main idea is, if you have recently heard a syntactic structure, you are likely to reuse it if an opportunity presents itself. In other words, if you have formulated a certain grammatical pattern not so long ago, you are likely to do the same thing again because you have some practice at it, essentially. So, um, a priming experiment usually works in a way that participants are presented with a prime, yeah? and in this case here we have a prime that goes like this, the referee was punched by one of the fans. You recognize that as a passive construction, okay? So people were just told to, you know, read the sentence, read the sentence. The referee was punched by one of the fans. And then in the next step, people were asked to describe a picture. And uh, well, here you see a church, you see a lightning, and that that's supposed to be clouds, yeah? So. Um, you could describe this picture in different ways. You could say, oh, there's a lightning and the lightning strikes the church. Or you could say, hmm, the church is being struck by a lightning. So you could either use an active construction or a passive construction. And it turns out that if people had been primed with a passive construction, they were more likely to use the passive in the description of this picture. Yeah, that's called a syntactic priming effect. Uh, it doesn't just work with the passive construction, it also works with other constructions. Here is another prime. The undercover agent sold some cocaine to the rock star. That's a construction that's called a prepositional dative construction. Right. People who are primed with this and that were later asked to describe this picture, guess what they said? They said something like, oh, the granddad is reading a story to the grandchild, and that's exactly the same structure as the undercover agent sold some cocaine to the rock star. Notice that you have other choices. You could say, um, the granddad read the child a story. Yeah, that would be the, dit the ditransitive construction. Works just as well, but if you are primed with the preposition and dative, you tend to reuse that in your descriptions of the picture. So, there are several factors at play in syntactic priming. For instance, there is something that's called a lexical boost. Syntactic priming is especially strong if it is supported by the recurrence of the same main verb. Yeah? So if you have the, the, the agent sold the cocaine to the rock star and then you have another selling situation, 
there there's the lexical boost people will want to use the same construction again there's also called something called a production boost syntactic priming is especially strong if the speaker has produced the prime herself or himself and has not just heard it you know, has not just heard somebody else produce that and in priming effects there is transience so that the priming effect wears off with time you know Right now, maybe you're still primed with the ditransitive, with the prepositional dative and with the passive, but in a couple of minutes' time, no longer. So, um, that's what I wanted to say about speech production, conceptualization, formulation, articulation. We didn't talk about articulation, actually, um, but keep in mind that those are the important processes there and some important terms to keep in mind are mental lexicon, what's a lemma, what's the tip of the tongue phenomenon, malapropisms, the Stroop task, exchange errors, spoonerisms, and syntactic priming, and what do they show us about the organization of the mental lexicon and how speech production is organized. All right, thanks for watching and I hope I'll see you soon.